Up to you. Take it away. <laughs> okay. So thanks for joining us in the SF Deep Learning Meetup. And I'm proud to introduce you guys to Srinath here. Uh, he's a postdoctoral at Stanford, and he does some amazing research specifically. Maybe it'll be, you know, the, the robot uprising will start from him. I don't know. But I, I got really excited when I saw the topic and what he's going to share with us. So uh, thank you very much, Srinath, for coming, and uh, it's yours. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction, you are. I mean, you talked about the ro robot up uprising. So I have something <laughs> at the end of the talk, oh, uh, which will answer your question. So. <laughs> Let me see if this works. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, as, as you all were saying, I'm a, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford. Uh, so I've been there from uh, since 2017. Um, and uh, you know, the my main area of my research is computer vision. Um, but I also work on related areas in human computer interaction and robotics. Uh, so I'm part of a much larger group at Stanford, the Geometry Computation Group, uh, which is led by Professor Leo Gibas. You know, these are my uh, awesome colleagues and collaborators. Uh, so we, we are a pretty large group of about 20 people uh, working on problems uh, related to 3D deep learning, 3D computer vision, and, and so on. So before I moved to Stanford, I was at the Max Planck Institute of Informatics in Germany. Uh, I did my PhD there and I finished it in 2016. Uh, and my thesis was about gesture-based computer input uh, for emerging devices like virtual and augmented reality glasses. Uh, and before that, I was at various places, including the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, uh, at Microsoft Research, and, and at the Honda Research Institute uh, down in Mountain View here. So yeah, today I wanted to talk about uh, deep learning for digitizing human physical skills, uh, and specifically focusing on how we are using deep learning for uh, digitizing human physical skills. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that uh, in the next few slides. So one of the key characteristics that distinguishes humans from other animals is our ability to interact with diverse environments. Uh, you know, here, here you can see some of, some of these uh, diverse environments that I talk about. Uh, for instance, we might go to, uh, go to, the, go to the market, you know, buy some vegetables. Uh, we can skillfully manip manipulate these vegetables, look, visually inspect them, and uh, decide if we want to buy them or not. Uh, we can also use tools and machinery to build uh, infrastructure like buildings. Uh, we can interact with other humans uh, through gestures, like the one that you see here on the bottom left. Uh, or we can you know, operate in our kitchens and interact with the ingredients and the tools in, in, in kitchens to uh, make a recipe, for instance. So uh, what these videos kind of showcase is that um, we are able to skillfully manipulate objects in our environments, and we are able to interact with diverse sets of environments. And one of the key things with uh, many of these interactions is that we use our hands uh, to do that. And also, you know, as the point that I want to make here is that our lives are extraordinarily interactive. Uh, you know, from the moment we wake up uh, until we go to bed, we are constantly interacting with something. So many of you are interacting with a pizza right now, for instance. So we are in constant interaction and uh, we are constantly manipulating our environment. And one of the key Parts of our body that we uh, make use of for this interaction are our hands. Um, you know, as, as these images show, we play sports uh, with our hands. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, trivia here is, you know, can, can someone name any sport that does not involve the use of hands? Uh, no, it does, right? Because when, you know, when, when the person has to throw from the outside, you still have to use your hands. Uh, you can't play soccer without your hands. Uh, I do have an answer, so if you're interested, please ask me at the end of, at end of my talk, and I'm going to... Uh, I've been thinking about this for several years now, so that's, that's not a sport necessarily. By sport, I mean something that's competitive where you compete with other people, uh, you know. Sorry? <laughs> no, you'll have to wait till the end of the talk. <laughs> Good. So, so what, what I mean is, you know, there's... We can agree and disagree on whether something is sport or not, but uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is, uh, is that a lot of the activities that we perform uh, in our lives involve the use of hands. You know, we make coffee, we cook, you know, all of these involve our hands. And I would argue that much of human intelligence, the way we kind of showcase it, is, is through action and interaction with our environments, and very specifically through our hands by manipulating objects that we have in, in these environments. So why is this useful? Uh, why, is this, uh, why is it useful to study these kinds of interactions? And why is it useful to encode human physical skills? Uh, it's useful because, you know, let's say we want to build robots that can cook just like we do. Uh, we currently don't have such robots. 
Um, so, uh, you know, one of the applications and one of the goals of trying to digitize human physical skills uh, is to kind of capture this knowledge that we have when we interact with our environments. Um, for instance, to build better robots uh, that can, you know, cook for us, for instance. We also need to understand human physical skills uh, in order to uh, in order to build better interactive techniques for emerging devices like virtual uh, reality glasses, augmented reality glasses, and mixed reality glasses. Uh, so we need to understand what, how we interact with the environment. We need to understand physical skills to build better prosthetics. You know, prosthetics uh, which you know, people with, uh, am amputed, uh, with amputations can, can kind of use, make use of uh, to perform everyday activities. Uh, and finally, we need to understand these uh, interactions so that we can better recognize and classify what a person is up to, you know, what, what activity they are uh, up to. And this is useful in many different areas. So uh, just to kind of uh, summarize what I've just said before, you know, you, you find videos like these on YouTube. Uh, and the goal of my research is to uh, digitize human physical interactions such as these and manual, human manual skills uh, from visual data. And the reason why I say visual data here is because uh, you, know, as I, you know, you can find thousands of such videos on YouTube. So if you go on YouTube and search for uh, extremely skilled workers, you, you probably get thousands of, uh, you know, workers doing these extraordinary uh, manual activities. And by manual, I mean things that involve the use of hands and uh, interacting with objects. Uh, so, so the idea here is that we have this trove of information on the internet, on YouTube and other places. We have these large video collections of people interacting with, you know, different kinds of objects. So we want to make use of these, this, this treasure trove of information about how we interact with objects uh, and to build a knowledge base of uh, how humans interact and use this for different kinds of applications in robotics, uh, human computer interaction, uh, prosthetics and, uh, and, and uh, action recognition and other areas. So that's, that's kind of the goal of my research. So we've kind of touched upon you know what what i mean by human physical skills what i mean by manual skills uh, and what what our goal is you know our goal is to kind of re record and reuse these skills from visual data um, what are the challenges and what are the problems that we need to solve what are the technical problems that we need to solve in order to uh, achieve our goal of digitizing human physical skills um, so the first challenge is is that we need to understand what humans are up to so we need to understand uh, what pose I'm currently standing in, uh, what the pose of my hand is, you know, what the articulations of my fingers are, what uh, uh, and how, uh, you know, we perform these motions in order to uh, achieve our goal, in interaction goals. So that's kind of the first component of digitizing human physical skills. There's also the environment, uh, which is the second component. So how do we uh, figure out what objects are in the environment? What are these objects? What is this a chair or is this a sofa? What, what are these objects? Uh, what pose are these objects in? Uh, what is the shape of these objects? Uh, and how these objects are laid out in our environments? Uh, how does the environment look like? How does this room layout look like? So there's a lot of things in the environment that we need to understand in order to e uh, effectively digitize human physical interactions and skills. And the third component is the interface between the first two components. So how does, you know, how does knowing what, the, uh, what, what, what motions hu humans perform and how does knowing what objects they interact with, how do, we, how do we mix these two things together? So how do we figure out what kinds of interactions humans perform on objects? Uh, and what are the customs involved in uh, how I grab a coffee mug, for instance? So we also need to have a physical understanding, of, uh, an understanding of physical interactions that humans have uh, with everyday objects. And the key thing here is we, we need to ha kind of develop an understanding for all, these th all three of these components in three dimensions. So it's not just sufficient to understand this in images, but we need to understand this in, actual, in the actual 3D world that we live in. Uh, because that can give us a richer ways of uh, you know, solving many problems in robotics and augmented reality and so on. So, uh, so this kind of lays out what are the technical problems and what are the challenges uh, that we need to solve in order to digitize human physical skills. Uh, the rest of my talk is essentially going to be uh, drilling down into each of these components and giving you examples of how we've developed techniques that can solve a subset of, of these, the problems in each of these boxes that, that, that we have here. Uh, and, and I'm basically going to show how we solve each of these uh, problems uh, using deep learning. So that's, that's the, kind, the, the goal of my talk. So the first uh, 
part that I want to start with is the human understanding part. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'd like to develop a 3D understanding of how humans move, uh, how our bodies move, how our hands move, uh, so that later we can use this for different kinds of applications, which I'm, which I'm going to talk about in detail. And again, as I said, I'm, I'm going to be showing uh, samples of uh, projects that I've worked on, research that we've worked on. Uh, there's, there's a lot more that we've worked on and a, lo and, and a lot more that the community has worked on. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about uh, you know, related work and other things uh, after, after my talk. So the first project that I wanted to talk about is called uh, VNet. So some of you might have heard of the Microsoft Kinect. Uh, so this is like a depth sensor that uh, looks at uh, uh, people and then you can kind of uh, make use of the depth sensor to uh, figure out what the pose of the person is, what the motion of the person is, and so on. Uh, so this is kind of a play on, uh, on the word Kinect. Uh, so this stands for Video Kinect. Uh, and, and you'll know pretty soon why it's called Video Kinect. Uh, and this was work done at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics and led by Dushant Mehta. So as I said, you know, uh, the Microsoft Kinect is, is a fairly successful device, uh, maybe not, in, not for consumers, but definitely in the, in the computer vision research community, uh, which, which has been widely used for different kinds of um, applications and games. Uh, so the idea is that you have a depth sensor. Uh, depth sensors are uh, sensors that can give us uh, how, uh, in, in addition to just showing us what, what the world looks like, they also tell us how far away things are. Uh, and what these sensors uh, give us is these so-called depth maps, uh, which is basically how far away each pixel in space is. Uh, and it turns out that you can use this rich information to track where the person is. So the Kinect full body pose estimation algorithm uh, is something that you find in uh, many, that many games use for different kinds of um, interactive applications. Uh, but the problem with uh, this and you know, similar related methods is that uh, they are limited to this hardware solution. Uh, so let's say uh, you, you want to do something cheaper. You, you'd like to do something with a smartphone camera. Uh, and you'd like to operate outdoors, for instance. Uh, these depth sensors cannot operate outdoors uh, because they use infrared uh, wavelengths. And, and the uh, sunlight uh, produces a lot more infrared radiation. So it blocks the uh, images from these depth sensors. Um, so we wanted something that was a bit more lightweight, a bit more uh, something that does not use uh, expensive hardware like the Kinect, uh, and something that we can just use from a smartphone. So that's you know the first goal. There's also been a lot of work in the 2D pose estimation community uh, where they've tried to estimate where the joints of the person are out on the image. Uh, so when I mean body pose estimation, what we're really interested in is where, where are the joints of uh, where are the joints of the of, of our body, right? So uh, where is my elbow? Where is my knee? And things like that. So typically, the way this is parameterized is uh, by a 21 uh, joint, uh, 21 vectors that represent the joint positions, the X Y Z joint positions. Uh, so there's there's been a lot of work in the 2D pose estimation community where they give us these uh, you know 2D joint locations. Um, and, and there's, there's been a, a, a lot of work in, in the community that kind of tries to uh, do this. Uh, but again, the problem here is this does not give us 3D information. Uh, and 3D information is something that we really need in order to uh, do many of these interactive applications later. There's also been some work on uh, 3D bo uh, body pose estimation before we presented uh, VNet, uh, but most of these approaches were limited by runtime efficiency. Uh, so each of these methods would take a minute to run on one image. And again, that's not something that's useful for interactive applications. So what we want, uh, to kind of summarize all of this, what we want is something that works with consumer smartphone cameras or webcams. Uh, we want something that uh, produces 3D results, and we want something that is interactive, something that is real time. So essentially what we want is, is this that you see here. So the idea here is we want to use a single web camera or a smartphone camera. Uh, and we want to track the person here in 3D uh, and retarget the motion of the person to a virtual character that you see on the left. And we want all of this to happen in real time. So this, kind, this is kind of uh, the goal of our method. And, and uh, you know, what we did was we developed a method that uses, as I said, a single RGB camera. So we don't need multiple cameras. Uh, it works for diverse, uh, something that works on diverse scenes. So we can actually grab videos from YouTube, and then we can track people in YouTube videos. Uh, and, and, and this is something that we wanted. Um, and also something that works in real time. Uh, in our method, we present uh, a solution that is over 40 frames per second and something that you can use for um, games or other interactive applications. And finally, we want some, a method that is uh, accurate, robust, and stable as well. 
So how, how does our method work? Um, you know, this, this is the San Francisco deep learning meetup. So obviously we use deep learning for that. Uh, so the idea here is that we have an input RGB image um, of a person performing some kind of a motion. Uh, we have a convolutional neural network that takes in this image as input uh, and produces uh, two things, uh, what we call heat maps and location maps. I'm gonna describe what they are in the next slide. Um, and yeah, for the, uh, the network that we use here is a ResNet 50 architecture, uh, and yeah, so the, so the idea is we go from this input here to the heat maps and the location maps uh, that you see here. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna dive a little bit into the technical details. You know, please feel free to ask questions uh, now or at the end of the talk uh, if something is unclear. Uh, but the idea here is that, um, again, as I said, our goal is to estimate the 3D locations of the joints of the person. And we parameterize the person with 21 joints. Uh, so we want to know the XYZ position of each of these 21 joints in, in the human body. So uh, the way we do it is we ask our network to predict two kinds of outputs. Uh, the first one is called a heat map, and the second one is called a location map. Uh, so what a heat map encodes is, you know, this is the one shown on the first column here. Uh, and what this encodes is, it encodes the likelihood of a particular joint occurring at a specific point in the image, at, at a specific pixels in the image. For, for example, um, the left uh, elbow has a high likelihood of uh, being in this position. And that's kind of represented by this color coding that you see here on the top left. And we repeat this for each of the 21 joints in the human body. So the network predicts 21 such heat maps. Uh, the remaining three columns that you see here uh, are what we call location maps. And what these location maps encode uh, is that they encode the XYZ position of the likely point where, the, uh, where a particular joint lies. So for example, it's likely that the left elbow um, lies at this, at a certain x value, uh, y value, and z value. And the way we kind of uh, predict that is that we first look at the heat map, we take the maximum likelihood of uh, where this uh, joint is likely to be, and we look up the corresponding points of the location map, exactly the same pixels on the location map. That is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the heat maps and the location maps. Uh, once we've done that, we just read out the XYZ values from each of the location maps. And what we get is a 3D position, a 3D vector that represents the XYZ position of that particular joint. And we repeat this process uh, for each one of the 21 joints that we have uh, in, in the heat map uh, predictions. So that gives us these uh, 21 XYZ positions, which represents where uh, the joints of the person are. And we can connect up these, uh, yeah, Sorry. questions. Um, so your input is a 2D image. It's a 2D image. So obviously, X and Y are easy to pinpoint, but uh -huh. how do you guys kind of do the seed part? Right, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, there is, it's intrinsically ambiguous uh, to kind of predict where, what the 3D position is. Uh, so we actually don't get the actual 3D position, but we get these so-called root relative 3D positions, which basically uh, tell us what the 3D location of a joint is relative to the center of the body, the center of mass of the body. Relative, uh, these are relative <coughs> locations. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of a detail there. But, but the thing is, that the, 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 this, is a, this is a fundamentally ill post problem. So we can't go from 2D to 3D without losing information. Uh, but what these networks do, they learn from lots and lots of data uh, to do exactly that. Uh, and, and that's something that you know, humans and animals can do without any problem. Uh, yeah, so, so the idea here is that we kind of, oh yeah, sure. Uh, so the question was, uh, I, I think the question was, why do we have the location maps as a map instead of just a particular XYZ position, right? Is that the question? Uh, yeah, so, so you're asking why uh, the location maps are an image instead of just being numbers, right? Is that the question? Uh, I think that's the question, if I understand correctly. Yeah, so, so the idea here is that we want to um, incorporate a certain level of uh, flexibility uh, in the location maps, because uh, even if the heat map were slightly incorrect, let's say, they're a couple of pixels off, we still want the XY, XYZ maps to be fairly close to the true value. Uh, we don't want them to be wildly far away. So having this as a map implicitly encodes a bit of variance into into the, into the location that we try to predict. If these, this was just one, one uh, value, then we would, you know, it would be more fuzzy. So we would be prone to making more mistakes, essentially. 
Right, so um, we now have this method that gives us uh, these 3D joint locations. Uh, and, uh, and from the heat maps, we also have these 2D joint locations. So we have both of this, these pieces of information. Uh, now, what I mentioned earlier is we want something that is interactive and something that we can use for games and other kinds of applications. Uh, so what we do is we take these 2D detected key points, the 3D articulations, the 3D joint positions, um, and, and we also have like a tracking method that does this over a uh, sequence of frames. So, so not just one frame, but over a video, essentially. Uh, and what it does is it tracks these key points over uh, uh, a sequence of frames rather than just one frame. So this gives us this temporal smoothness that we need for many kinds of applications. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details there, but I'm definitely happy to talk about it later if you're interested. Um, yeah, and the idea is that we want to uh, estimate uh, the, the pose of the, uh, of, of the person uh, in terms of joint angles, because joint angles are some a representation that are that is readily usable in computer uh, in character animation games, for example. So if you want to retarget my motion to uh, some other character, uh, joint angles are the way to go because it's it's much easier to do this retargeting between human motion and uh, and character motion. Uh, and that was one of the applications that we are interested in. So that's that's why we kind of have this pipeline to do that. How do you do the uh, for the for the training the CNN you mean uh, so yeah we I, I didn't talk about it but we have a really big uh, data set uh, which was captured in a mo motion capture studio so we had like you know 20 cameras and then we put markers uh, we don't actually put markers so it's a markerless motion capture studio uh, but we get the pose of the person uh, using these 20 cameras uh, and then we also have a method where we kind of augment the background with different kinds of background images uh, so that with that we generate over 200,000 example images to train the CNN. So let me show you some examples. Uh, so what you see here is we use a single webcam. It's a Microsoft standard uh, Microsoft webcam. Uh, and that's looking at the person over there. Uh, and as you can see, it can track the person in real time. That's the result on the right. Uh, but it can also drive a character, the animation of a character, as you see on the left. So here's more examples that show that you know, it can handle complex motion, like you know. Uh, rotating uh, in the back. So irrespective of whether the person is facing the camera or not, we are still able to track uh, what the person is up to. Uh, so we can uh, you know, track uh, complex motions like these. Question? Do you incorporate any knowledge of the human skeleton? Uh-huh. Like, like, like right, so we, uh, yeah, again, I, I didn't talk about that, but we do have an optimization scheme inside that takes into account the joint angle limits. Uh, so what are the plausible, biomechanically plausible motions that our bodies can undergo? So yeah, that's, that's kind of implicit in here. Yeah, so, so to kind of summarize uh, you know, the, this, this part of the talk, um, you know, what I presented was a method to, to estimate the full 3D pose of a person um, and something that just uses a single web camera or a smartphone camera. Um, this can run in, in real time. It can work in uncontrolled scene conditions. Uh, and it can also track babies, as you can see in this in this video. So of course, um, you know this method does have its limitations. Uh, one limitation is really fast motion, um, and and we can't yet track multiple. Actually, we have a follow-up paper which can do multiple people, uh, but at least in this in this particular work that I'm showing, we don't we don't track multiple people simultaneously. Uh, and of course, the robustness can can definitely be improved. The accuracy and robustness of this method can can be improved. So um, the, uh, I'm not going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, details about the second project here, but, you know, uh, I wanted to briefly show some results here because, you know, initially I talked about interactions and manual physical skills, right? Uh, and manual means hands. Uh, and how do we track hands? Uh, so we worked on this problem as well. So we had this paper at CVPR last year uh, where we showed that it's possible to use similar but not the same techniques because the hand has certain unique challenges. Uh, such as you know uniform color, you know faster motion, and so on. So we had to uh, rethink the techniques that we use for tracking hand motion. Uh, but we did something. Um, we we did this, and then you know we had this work at CVPR last year, which was led by PhD student uh, Franziska Miller in Germany. Uh, and you know the results that we get are you know something like this. I'm, I'm just going to show the results here. But if you're interested in the in the actual techniques that that we used, uh, you know feel free to talk to me after after the presentation. Um, yeah, as you can see, we can track really complex motion when the object is manipulating an, an object, uh, another, when the hand is manipulating another object. Uh, and, and this is all in 3D. So the, the pose that we get is in, uh, in 3D world. It's not just 2D pose. So 
So what I've talked about so far is um, you know, of the three boxes that I described earlier. It's the human physical, human understanding, the 3D human understanding component. How can we use computer vision techniques? How can we use deep learning for uh, understanding what human motion is, uh, where humans are, how humans are, hands are moving, how human bodies move, and so on. So that's the first component of digitizing human physical skills. The second component, of course, is understanding our environments. Uh, what are the objects in our environments? How do, we, uh, how, how do these objects look like? What is their shape? Um, what is their pose? Uh, and what, what their layouts are in the scene? So this is the second piece of information that we need uh, in this you know, physical skills puzzle. So uh, an example that I wanted to show here from some of our previous, uh, some of our recent work uh, is this work that we're going to have at CVPR this year in the next couple of months. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, we'd like to be able to uh, understand where objects are in a scene, uh, but we've never seen these objects before. We've seen, uh, you know, I've, I've seen plenty of chairs before, but I've never seen this exact chair before. But as a human, I have no trouble figuring out where this chair is in the world, right? So we want to kind of endow computers with exactly the same kind of ability. Um, and, and this was done at Stanford, and, and He Wang, the PhD student, he, he led this project. So as I said, you know, uh, let's say you go to a friend's place, right? Uh, you've never been to your friend's place before, but you look at this desk in your friend's place. Uh, and uh, these con this desk now is, you know, it's quite cluttered. It contains objects that you've never seen before. Um, but you, you'd have no trouble figuring out where this object was, what the shape of this object is. So the idea here is um, many applications, especially in augmented reality and virtual reality, uh, need this capability. So we need to operate in environments that we've never been in before. Uh, so, so the goal of this project is to um, estimate the pose of, figure out where objects are in a scene, uh, even if we've never seen these objects before. And, and that's something that, that is called the category level pose estimation problem in computer vision. Uh, and and this, in this project, we kind of tried to tackle that problem. There's been a lot of previous work in object pose estimation. Um, and, and typically, these are instance level 60 object pose estimation. So the idea here is uh, we are given um, RGB images or RGBD images or video. And we'd like to estimate the 3D translation and the 3D rotation of each of these objects in the scene. Um, but the assumption here is that these are known object instances. So we've seen these objects before, and we have models for these objects. So we can kind of use um, many techniques in computer vision. Um, uh, these are, you know, there, there are optimization techniques, and there are analysis by synthesis techniques, uh, which take, you know, models of objects that we know and try to fit that to image data. So when we have these known object instances, you know, it's not a problem. And, and there's been a long history of work in this area, and, and this is called like instance level 60 pose estimation. The category level 60 pose estimation problem, uh, which is when we don't have models of objects that we are interested in, uh, is, is a li little bit more challenging. Um, and, and people have looked into this problem as well. Uh, for instance, in this work uh, from, uh, from Berkeley, uh, what they had was uh, they had as input uh, RGBD images, RGB or RGBD images. Uh, and their goal was to estimate, again, the 60 pose, so the three translation and the three rotation parameters. Um, but then they have an additional type of input, which is, which is that they assume there is a repository of CAD models, a repository of CAD models at test time. So when, when we are in, in, out in the world, uh, we assume that we have this repository of information that we can kind of look up, look up uh, every time we encounter a new object. So that's, that's the uh, assumption here. Uh, but again, you know, making this assumption is, is pretty hard. Like you don't always, you, you can't always have sufficiently large Rep, uh, model repositories that can contain all kinds of models that you've uh, encountered, that you would encounter in real life. So that's, that's a limitation with these kinds of approaches. So uh, our goal then is, you know, we, we'd like to go from RGB uh, or RGBD images, like the ones shown on the left here, and we'd, and we'd like to operate in completely new environments, containing new objects that we've never seen before. And we want to figure out what object we are looking at. We want to figure out what the silhouette of the object is on the image. And we'd like to estimate the 60 pose and size of these objects. We'd like to figure out how big they are uh, and also where they are located in the real world. And this is challenging because we are now making the assumption that there is no other type of input. So we don't assume this repository of models that, that I talked about uh, in the previous slide. Uh, and also, you know, how do we represent, if we don't have a repository, then how do we represent the shape of these models? That's, that's a very uh, difficult problem to solve. 
Um, there's also no data sets that can help us train our machine learning algorithms for these kinds of problems. So we also had to create our own data sets. Uh, and finally, how do we generalize this to completely new environments? So that's, that's also a significant <laughs> challenge. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes on this slide because this is important to understand to understand the rest of the method. Um, so to kind of solve this problem uh, of estimating the pose of objects that we've never encountered before, we present this new representation that we call the normalized object coordinate space representation. We call it NOx. Uh, the idea here is, um, so as I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we call this the category level pose estimation problem. And, and what I mean by that is that um, in computer vision, uh, you know, people try to classify all objects they encounter into categories. Uh, and in computer vision, people say that, you know, typically there's between 10,000 to 20,000 categories that uh, humans have to deal with in their en entire life lifespan. Uh, and, and so this makes for easier, it make, makes it easier for us to kind of cluster objects together uh, and treat them as, you know, separate entities, uh, which can help us solve several downstream tasks. So that's kind of the goal with uh, having these categories, uh, shape categories or object categories. Um, so the idea here is that the key, the key insight here is that, uh, you know, it's possible that I've never seen this particular chair instance before, uh, but I've probably seen many chairs uh, that look similar to this or maybe not even similar, but I've, I've seen a lot of chairs in my lifetime. I've not seen this particular instance, but I've seen several other chairs. And the, and the idea is, can we use that, leverage that information to make predictions about new instance, new chairs that we see in, uh, in the future? Um, so the way we, uh, we kind of encode this information internally as a representation is, is using this Knox representation. And what, what, what this does is um, we take like a, a repository of shapes. Uh, so for instance, ShapeNet, ShapeNet is a repository of shapes uh, from our group at Stanford. Uh, and and what, what this repository has is it has hundreds of thousands of uh, exemplar models for each category. Uh, so for cameras, we would have, you know, shapes that look like this in this repository. And all of these shapes are consistently oriented. So the idea here is that, you know, if we have a repository like this, then we can create a representation that kind of maps these shapes into, these, into this normalized coordinate space that I talked about earlier. And the idea here is that when, if you can do this mapping, you can actually represent new instances that you see, uh, not in terms of the models that we've seen before, but in terms of this new representation that we have. So that's, that's at a very high level, that's, that's what this Knox representation does. So it's a, you can think of this as um, a dense correspondence between shapes that we see in the real world to some mathematical representative space. Uh, and the colors here, you know, the RGB colors here represents the XYZ position of a particular vertex in, 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 the, in the models that we have in the repository. So you, there's multiple ways of interpreting this representation. One way is to think of this as a shape reconstruction. Uh, so this representation allows us to re, uh, reconstruct shapes that we've never seen before, but still belong to the same category. Or you can think of this as dense correspondences, you know, the, the correspondences between uh, new instances that we see and this shape space that we have. And, and the key thing with the Knox representation is that it allows us to uh, make, uh, uh, it allows us to represent uh, objects within a category, even if there is large intra-category variation in topology. So this is how it looks like in, in 3D. So, you know, for the camera class, we have this Knox representation. Uh, it's just visualized as each point within the space is just visualized as an RGB color. So if you had a point that's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it would just look gray in this, in this image. So you said there are 10,000 predefined categories each with its own data sets having pre-labeled objects? Yes, uh, we don't have 10,000. Uh, so ShapeNet, I think, has probably a few te tens of categories. I'm not exactly sure what the number is. Uh, but, but what I meant by 10,000 is, you know, uh, computer vision, uh, in, in, in computer vision theory, people propose that there's likely between 10,000 to 30,000 object categories that we have to deal with uh, in our life lifetime. But these are human-generated categories? Uh, for this particular example, these are human-generated, yeah. And we, we use only six categories in this work. Uh, that's, that's a far cry from the 10,000 that we have. Right? So how do we do it? Again, you know, we use deep learning uh, for this problem. Um, some of you might be familiar with the MASCAR CNN um, work. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is something that researchers at Facebook uh, created uh, for detecting objects. So, you know, we, let's say we go to a new environment. We'd like to figure out what object this is and where, where it is on the 2D image. We do exactly the same thing, but we do this in 3D now. 
So the idea is that we take the mask RCNN network architecture uh, and we kind of augment it with additional branches, network branches that let us make these predictions about uh, the 3D shape of the object and the pose of the object. Uh, so mask CNN, uh, uh, you know, classifies uh, what object that we are looking at. It, it also gives an instance mask. Uh, in addition, we add this uh, new branch, which is which we call the Knox map prediction branch. Uh, and what these Knox maps are are essentially a projections of the Knox representation that I talked about earlier. So they are basically projections of the uh, RGB colored uh, images that you saw uh, uh, earlier, the RGB colored space that you saw earlier. So yeah, uh, the idea here is that uh, because we perform all these tasks simultaneously, each of these tasks kind of benefits from the other task. So we have uh, something called task synergy here where one task benefits from the other task and, and this is a good thing. Uh, yeah, I have, I have more details about the loss function we use for training uh, and the specific how do we handle symmetrical objects and things like that. But I'm going to, in the interest of time, just skip, skip on all these details. Uh, but I'm definitely happy to talk about it uh, later if you like. So one, one challenge that I mentioned earlier was uh, how do we train these networks? Where does the data come from? Um, so it, it's notoriously hard to uh, annotate data for machine learning algorithms. You know, people spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, annotating ground truth uh, labels for uh, data that they have to uh, get their deep learning networks to train, that they have to use for training their deep learning networks. Uh, instead, we kind of op opted for a mixed reality approach. So the idea is that synthetic images are easy to generate less expensive to generate, uh, but real images are very hard to uh, annotate. So can we combine the interesting properties of both of these uh, data sources uh, into one? And we call this mixed reality uh, approach. Uh, and also in addition to, uh, you know, one, one approach that people have tried is that you can render synthetic images, synthetic objects for instance, and then uh, composite this with, uh, you know, real image backgrounds. So that's something that people have tried. Uh, but it turns out that you know, for this particular problem, context is really important. So what we do here is we mix these two images, the real data, real images and synthetic objects in a way that is context aware. And what I mean by context aware is that you know, we render these synthetic images um, like the ones shown here uh, on top of real images that look like this. But we do it in a context aware manner such that the objects rendered here lie on the plane of, of the table that we have here. So what we did was we went to IKEA, um, scanned tens of tables because IKEA tables don't have objects on them. Uh, you know, tables like these have objects on them. Uh, we don't want that. So we went to IKEA, you know, scanned uh, a few tens of tables, and then we put these synthetic objects on top of these tables. Uh, so we detected planar surfaces and then put these objects on top of, uh, on top of this table. Um, and the good thing with that is we don't have to do any manual annotation anymore because, because this is synthetic data. Uh, we get these annotations for free. You know, we control the whole synthetic data generation pipeline. So we get all this data for free. So yeah, we did this. Uh, we did this and we generated over a quarter of a million uh, training images. Uh, these images look something like this. Um, so you know, as you can see, you can still see the IKEA labels over here. Um, so the idea is that we have these tables and then we can put these uh, virtual objects on top of the table. So this is what I mean when I say it's context aware. So it's aware of what, where the table is so that I can place objects on top of the table. Uh, yeah, and, and we actually show that this, this helps in performance and I'm not going to talk about it here, but uh, it, it, the details are in the paper. We also collected a real data set because, you know, uh, training it on mixed reality data is great, uh, but ultimately we need, need this to work on uh, real images. Uh, so we have this data set and you see these really nice QR codes uh, and we use these codes to figure out where the camera is relative to these objects so that we have ground truth information for validating uh, our algorithm. So these are some qualitative results. Again, I'm going to focus on the qualitative results here. Um, I can talk about the specific numbers later if you're interested. Um, but you know, what you see here on the top is the input image. So these are our mixed reality images. Um, this is the ground truth Knox map, which I described earlier. Uh, these are our predictions. Uh, and, and then we have an additional step that tries to fit, um, we have a step, a model fitting, uh, not, sorry, not a model fitting step, but a post fitting step where, where we try to figure out where exactly the object is from, from these uh, Knox map representation. Uh, so I, I, I didn't talk about the details there, but we do have an additional step that allows us to go there. Uh, and, and we achieve, you know, reasonable quality on, on uh, mixed reality data. We also did the same thing on, on real data. Um, question? Uh, 
Uh, could you speak up a little bit louder? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the question is, you know, do we create shadows when we do this mixed reality comp composition? Uh, we don't actually uh, create shadows. Uh, we do have re realistic lighting, uh, but we don't create shadows at this point. Uh, but that's something that, that's really interesting for future work. So how can you add shadows and other pieces of information that would make this data look more realistic? Okay, so to kind of summarize uh, this, this part of my talk, um, you know, we presented a method for category level pose estimation. Uh, so we want to figure out what the object is, what the silhouette of the object is, and where the object is, uh, simultaneously in a single neural network. Uh, we don't have any CAD models available during testing. We have them available during training though, and we kind of exploit this to uh, encode them in this uh, NOx representation. And that allows us to do something that was previously not possible. Um, and, and finally, you know, there was no data sets available, so we created our own data set for training these algorithms, uh, and, and it turns out that there's re really nice, interesting uh, problems to be solved there as well. I mean, of course, there's, there's also limitations with, uh, with this approach. You know, we, we don't have a lot of classes here. We, you know, as, 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 um, the there was a question earlier about this. Uh, we don't do like 10,000 classes. We have only six classes, and that's, that's a limitation. Um, and finally, there's still a domain gap between the mixed reality data that we uh, generate and, and the real world. And, and you know, adding shadows and things like that would definitely help with that. And of course, uh, performance of our network can also be improved. So we, we, we get reasonable results. And, and given that this is one of the first works out there to solve this problem, we get reasonable results. But there's definitely uh, scope for improvement there. OK, so uh, what I've talked about so far um, are basically the uh, human motion understanding in 3D uh, and the object and scene centric understanding in 3D as well. Uh, and again, you know, I should mention here that I, I just gave some samples of uh, for each of these components that I described earlier, the three components. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to be done here and a lot more to be explored. I'm, I'm kind of just giving you a, a sampling of each of these boxes. Uh, so the last component is essentially the the interface between the two, the human and the objects uh, and, and the environment, right? So how do we develop a, 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 like a physical interaction understanding? So how do we figure out how humans interact with objects? Um, and what are the customs involved in interacting with objects? Uh, and this is, this is a very challenging and uh, an important problem to solve. So the first work that I'd like to uh, show here is, is this upcoming work at Eurographics next month. Um, and this was again led by um, PhD student He Wang and former postdoc at Stanford, uh, uh, Zoran Perk. So our goal here was to um, try to capture, uh, try to digitize human object interactions. Uh, so when we sit, in a, sit at a table and we interact with objects in the table, uh, how, do we, how do we record this information and somehow encode this information and later reuse this information? So that was the goal of this project. And we wanted to do this from visual data because again, uh, there's large video collections like in YouTube or other places that we can kind of exploit for uh, extracting this kind of knowledge. Um, and of course, there's other sources of information as well. You know, you could you know, read Wikipedia, uh, and Wikipedia probably has detailed accounts of how to assemble uh, a drone, for example, right? So there's detailed, uh, such information is available uh, in Wikipedia. So that's, you know, at, that's, that's described in natural language. It's a, described in English or some other language. Uh, and that's one way of representing human object interactions, if you think about it. So that's, you know, at one extreme. So it's very abstracted. It doesn't have the exact details. It's very high level. At the other end, we have physical simulation. So you could take a graphics package. You could use Blender, for instance, to phys physically simulate uh, what are the, you know, what is the physics involved in humans interacting with objects. So what, how, 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 how much force is applied, how much the object moves, and things like that. So that's at the other extreme, where we track the trajectories of uh, human hands and objects. But what we want is something in the middle. We want something that is um, high level, yet captures some of the key details of this low level physical simulation that we have. So our goal here was to uh, figure out a compact representation that allows us to stay in the middle here instead of being at you know, the abstract extreme or the, uh, the detailed extreme. Uh, so we wanted to uh, develop a representation uh, that allows us to do this. Uh, we wanted to get to this representation from video collections. So we wanted to use YouTube videos to uh, get to a representation of human object interactions. Uh, and finally, we wanted to uh, generate new human object interactions and show applications in robotics and other areas. Uh, and I'll be showing you some cool videos at, uh, in a couple of slides. So the pipeline that we 
half of this is you know is shown here again you know don't worry about all the details but uh, uh, you know uh, the high level idea is that we have these input videos these are video collections uh, for instance from youtube uh, and we'd like to learn from these videos what are the you know actions and what what is involved in human object interaction so we'd like to uh, get a representation out of these videos once you have these rep uh, this representation we'd like to have a neural network that can generate new representations which are similar to the representations that we've seen uh, but they're not exactly the same so this way we are generating new motion new human object interactions that we've never seen before and once we have that we can use this for different kinds of applications so we can use this for planning uh, motion in robots we can use this for action prediction we can use this for uh, scene synthesis and, and so on So what representation do we use uh, to capture this information, right? So we want something that is compact, like la natural language, uh, but also something that can encode some of the details involved in human object interaction. Uh, so we propose these so-called uh, action plots, uh, and I'm gonna describe what this is. One, one, one observation to make here is that, you know, similar to uh, language, uh, human object interactions are sequential. So we can use the same techniques or similar techniques from natural language processing to model these, uh, these kinds of uh, interactions. Uh, so these action plots are kind of modeled on you know, how language is represented in NLP. Uh, and uh, and what, what the action plot is, is it's, it's essentially a sequence of what we call action tuples. Uh, uh, the action tuple here is essentially a, a set of uh, parameters that is uh, that, that represents the state of the hand object interaction at each video frame. So at each video frame, we have this action tuple T uh, that represents wh what object is in the scene, where is the hand, uh, what is the state of interaction between the hand and the object, uh, what is the position of the object, uh, what is the distribution of positions of the object, and important information like that. So we have action tuples for each uh, video frame. So we have T1, T2, T3, T3 and T4, uh, and what the action plot is, it's, it's, it's basically a sequence of action tuples. So a sequence of action tuples is called an action plot, and that is our representation, and that is what we aim to learn from video collections. So what this video shows is, you know, uh, let's say the input to our system is this video that you see on the top right there. We go from that to our action plot, and we visualize our action plots in a in a in a in an animation uh, you know in a in a virtual animation essentially. So what you see here is just a visualization of these action tuples, sets of action tuples that I talked about earlier. So we go from this to this uh, using our recognition pipeline. Uh, I'm, I'm going to you know not talk too much about how we uh, how our recognition pipeline works, but you know we use state of the art computer vision techniques, uh, object detection techniques, action recognition techniques to go from these video collections to this action plot representation that I mentioned. This is how our recognition pipeline works. So we you know, figure out you know, what are the objects in the scene, how many of these objects are in the scene, um, how the hand interacts with these objects, and so on. So again, the, the output that, that uh, we get at each time step is you know, object position, states, masks, actions, uh, and, and, and and also some other pieces of information that, that I'm uh, skipping here, but we do, a, do that as well. So once we have this um, action, uh, these action plots from large video collections, uh, how do we use it in interesting ways? Because that's, that's what, in the end, we are interested in, right? So we want to encode these uh, interactions and we want to use this in interesting ways in robotics and other applications. Um, Again, I'm going to skip through some of the details here, but, but the idea here is, uh, again, similar to natural language processing, we'd like to use recurrent neural networks to model the sequential problem. So we have these action plots that represent how humans interact with objects. Uh, we then um, train, an, uh, train an RNN that, that is capable of learning from these uh, action, uh, action plots that we've generated, and it's capable of generating new action plots that look similar to the ones that we've learned, but they're still distinct from the ones that we've learned. So it generates samples from a similar distribution of interactions. So what you see here on the left is a reconstructed ac action plot. So what you see on the left is, uh, was recorded from a video. So we have a video, uh, and this is the reconstructed recognized action plot. And what you have the, on the right is a, let me start that again. What you have on the right 
uh, is a generated action plot. So uh, we learned all these action plots and then we are now trying to generate something that looks similar. And, and that's what, uh, what is happening on the right. So you see that it kind of generates plausible motions. You know, the person drinks coffee uh, and then they take the book and read something in the book, you know, back to the coffee and so on. So here you see more examples. Uh, and again, on, on the, the right column here shows the input video and the reconstruction. Uh, and the left video shows a plausible uh, motion that the perf person might perform uh, in the same activity space, in the same table. So yeah, this is really cool. This is one of my favorite parts of, uh, one of the favorite applications that I have. So uh, the idea here is that um, we want to use these action plots to do predictive, uh, uh, assistive robots that can predict what the user intent is. Uh, so what's going on here is that um, Her, who's, who, who is the lead author in this, in this work, um, he's kind of trying to reach the mug. The mug is a smart mug. It's, 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 it's not a standard mug, so it can move on a table. Uh, and the idea here is that the, the, the system here is predicting what the person's intent is likely to be. So it's actually going from a video observation to these action plot representations. And then it's interpolating, uh, sorry, extrapolating to the future. So it's saying if, if, if the action uh, tuple at this time, time instant looks like this, it's likely that the person is going to perform a certain activity. So in this case, uh, it, it recognizes that when her reaches for the cup, it's likely that he wants to grab the cup and therefore let the cup move towards him, making it easier for him. And this is something that's really useful for you know, people, the elderly and people with disabilities. And also another cool thing is, if, it, if the system knows that you know, uh, uh, her here uh, holds a book, then it's not likely that he wants to grab the cup because his hand is already occupied with some other object. So it, it's, it's also able to de detect that. Uh, this is an, uh, another example of a more complex task because you know we are interested in uh, uh, encoding complex in interactions. So here, what's going on is uh, you know her grabs a bottle, uh, and and the system recognizes that if you if you grab a bottle, you're likely to pour the contents of the bottle into a cup, and then you drink from the cup. So that's that's what is going on here, and all of this is happening in real time. So we are able to go from videos uh, to these action plots, and then we are able to extrapolate to the future, and then make the robot move in a way that satisfies the user. So uh, to, to summarize you know, this, this part of the talk, um, what we did was we uh, developed a method for generating human object interactions. We had three steps in our pipeline, recognition, representation, and generation. Um, so we have you know, contributions in each, each part of this pipeline. Uh, but of course, there are uh, limitations here. So one thing that you might notice is that we don't capture articulations of the hand. Uh, and, and that's because it's very hard to capture articula hand articulations. And that's something that we need to work on for future work. And finally, there's you know a lot more variability in, in activity spaces. You know, you probably noticed that this is only for tables, uh, but you can do the same thing for other activity spaces like kitchens and work space, work desks, and, and so on. So the final thing that I wanted to show you was uh, some very recent work. We finished this a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, and and one of the one of the um, you know, important aspects of human object interaction is, is dynamics, right? So what happens when we manipulate objects? What happens when we push objects, right? So the goal of this project was to figure out, you know, and as humans, we have a very intuitive understanding of what happens when we push objects. So we know where they end up, we know what the likely uh, stability of the object is and, and so on. So we want to kind of end our machines with the same ability. Uh, and, and the idea here was, um, you know, if, if the input to the method is just a, a, a an observation of the object uh, and the force that we are applying to the object, can we predict where it's going to end up in the end? Is it going to topple over or is it going to uh, stop after moving on a planar surface after a while? So that was the goal of this project. Uh, and this was led by uh, Davis at, at Stanford. Again, I'm going to skip through almost all of the details, just show you some of the cool results. Um, and what you see here is uh, the gray bottle here. Uh, is, is the simulation. So we use Bullet, Bullet, which is a physics uh, game engine. We use Bullet to simulate these objects on a planar surface. We apply forces and we see where the object ends up. Um, and we then use this as training data for our network. Uh, so we use our network to learn what happens uh, when these objects are pushed. And the idea is we want the network to learn to predict what happens to the, 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 we want it to learn to predict the trajectory of the object after it's being, after it's been pushed. And, and the green, um, cup that you see here, that's, that's the, tra the trajectory that we predict, that, that our network, network predicts. And again, we use a recurrent neural network for, uh, for doing this. I, 
again, you know, doing it in simulation is one thing, doing it in the real world is the hard part. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we can do it in the, in the real world as well. So instead of bullet, we kind of replace the game engine now with the real world. So the real world is the game engine here. Uh, and what we do is we have a motion capture system that captures uh, how objects move in the real world. We take this data and then train the exact same network that we did, uh, that we used for the simulation uh, to show that it can generalize to real world uh, data as well. Uh, and you know, what you see here is, you know, the person, is the person here is pushing the object. And again, the gray box here is the uh, motion captured values. And the green box here is the prediction uh, that the system makes. We can also detect toppling. So when the object topples over, we can detect that as well. Okay, so what I've shown you is, is essentially glimpses of examples of uh, some of the problems that we need to solve in order to be able to digitize human physical skills. You know, the, the, these are essentially from uh, the, the three boxes that I talked about earlier. Human-centric understanding, object and scene-centric understanding, uh, and physical interactions uh, understanding. Uh, so I've shown you, you know, a, a subset of problems that we've been working on uh, for solving each of these boxes. But there's, of course, a lot more problems that need to be solved uh, before we get to a point where, you know, a robot can make, uh, you know, cook, cook, cook dinner for me tonight. That, that's not yet possible. So I think, you know, uh, you've probably all heard of the Turing test in artificial gen general intelligence. Uh, and you all actually pointed me to this uh, coffee test in uh, artificial general intelligence. Uh, and I think that kind of nicely sums up what we are trying to do in, in terms of digitizing human physical skills. Uh, I'm going to read it out here. So wh what it says here is, uh, what the coffee test is about is, is um, you know, if, if a machine, a, a, a machine is required to enter an average American home and figure out how to make coffee, find the coffee machine, find the coffee, add water, find a mug, grab the mug, and brew the coffee by pushing the proper buttons. This is something that every one of us here can do without any problems. Uh, but no robot that I know of can, can do this, right? And what I've done here is I've tried to highlight in bold the things that uh, I'm interested in, I'm really interested in. And all of these involve some form of uh, human object interaction. Uh, you know, enter an average American home, uh, add water, grab a mug, um, push buttons and things like that. So these are really difficult problems. And maybe some of you disagree. So I kind of wanted to show this really cool video of a robot trying to enter an average American home. Oops. <laughs> so yeah, the point is that, you know, in spite of all the hype and AI of people you know, claiming artificial general intelligence and, you know, all, all sorts of things. We are very far away from achieving uh, human level uh, intelligence. And I think, you know, capturing uh, human physical skills, digitizing human physical skills is central to creating artificial intelligence systems. And, and that's something that, that still needs a lot more work to be realized. So yeah, I think the takeaway message uh, that, that, that I'd like to convey is that there are many, many more problems that need to be solved. And deep learning is going to play a central role for many of these problems. Uh, but we also need to incorporate techniques from, uh, you know, many related areas, language, psychology, uh, the humanities, and, and so on. So that, that's a really important component of, uh, of uh, AGI. So yeah, with that, you know, thanks for listening. Happy to answer any questions. And yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, question. I'm, I'm sorry, could you, could you? I still can't hear you, sorry. Oh, a sports game. Oh, what, what is the game? I see, I see. Uh, uh, do you have any guesses? <laughs> Snowboarding, again, I think it's kind of like running. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like a sport that you play as a team, for example, or, you know, something like that. Not chess, you know, in chess you can probably play even without your hand. Uh, so I, I think I asked this question on Quora a couple of years ago, uh, and the consensus was um, luge. I don't know if you know luge. So it's like a, this, one of these winter sports. Uh, you kind of slide on a, on a sled and you go down these slopes, ice slopes, right? Uh, and I think that's something that doesn't necessarily require the use of fingers um, and hands. Uh, so yeah, that, that, yeah that, was, that was my, you know, you have to concede somewhere, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question. I was, I was curious about that last part of your presentation. You talked uh -huh. about you know, the using um, the 
the game engine to right, right. Uh -huh. pushing the object and it going and you know, seeing how far it goes. So essentially, the game engine is using physics-based models to predict how far the model right. the object uh -huh. moves. In the real life, it's a it's a variation of the same physics model right. that defines how far the object will move. Yes. Uh -huh. so if you are using deep learning, mm -hmm. you are actually unlearning the physics model and then you are relearning it to make a prediction. I, 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 I see a conflict there. Right, right. You have to do that? That's a good question. So it's essentially, the, the, what, what the question that you're trying to ask is, I think, um, why don't why, why are we trying to memorize? There's a non-physics model. There's a non-physics model. Why don't we make use of it? Right. right. So uh, two two answers to that. The, the first thing is our deep learning model, which I didn't talk about, uh, is is kind of based on physical laws. So so we you know develop the architecture such that it it it, it kind of incorporates physics laws implicitly. Inferring. So we, we kind of incorporate the physics laws into the architecture of the network. Uh, and you know, mo most of these physical equations that you need to solve to do simulation involve you know, uh, complex mathematics. So there's like differential equations that you need to solve. Um, and what the network does, it makes that part of uh, things a lot easier. Uh, so you don't need to solve differential equations anymore. Uh, but you just need to make predictions about uh, a different thing. Uh, but then the knowledge about the physics of the world is kind of implicitly encoded into the architecture as well. So the way we design the architecture, uh, we kind of design it in such a way that, uh, you know, velocity information is kind of treated as, as se separately. We assume constant coefficient of friction in this work. Um, uh, but we assume, like for instance, velocities are treated separately from the geometry. Uh, so we have, you know, interesting architectural changes that incorporate these priors implicitly. But I do agree that it's, it's important to kind of make use of physical laws. We know how things move in the real world and we have to make use of it. Uh, so that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. question. I, I understand why you only want to like look at one camera, but is there any research in trying to use something that represent, like models like the not their vision and animals and humans and stuff? Like could you just do cameras at once? Like how much easier would that be? Right. Uh, so there's there's a lot of work in the computer vision community on uh, on stereo vision. Uh, so there's like entire communities that just do stereo reconstruction uh, and so on. So there's extensive work that's been done. Um, and of course, you know, binocular views help a lot. We know that already uh, because essentially what they give us is disparity information. We know where where things are in the real world in 3D, and that's super useful. Um, a common theme, I guess, in most of the work that I talked about here is that we use monocular views. Uh, and, and I think the reason for that is we want to leverage information that is available on the internet on, in, in these large video collections, right? So if you think about progress in the NLP community, they've leveraged on text on the internet. So they've taken Wikipedia, they take large text corpora, and they've kind of make, made use of this information. And I think we need to do something very similar for computer vision in order to kind of um, move towards these more general difficult motor, motor tasks essentially. Uh, and that's something that we don't have yet. And, and you know, most of the video collections available uh, on the internet, they're not binocular or multi-view, they're monocular. Uh, and that's kind of the motivation for doing monocular videos. Question. You mentioned uh, that the, the current method that you showed for pose estimation relied on having a frame per joint pretty much. So, so like, there is something that somehow does multiple people's pose estimation. Is it completely different method or is there some adaptation there? So uh, that, that work is um, a development of this particular work. So, you know, th this work doesn't directly allow us to handle multiple people. So we had this paper at uh, 3DB last year uh, where we kind of added new features to this, to this particular work, uh, especially you know, to handle occlusions when multiple people are standing next to each other. Uh, so the network gets really confused whether it needs to associate joints with individual people essentially. Uh, and when, when you know, I'm standing next to another person, uh, the network has a very hard time figuring out whose uh, knee this is. Uh, so we had some really um, interesting insight there where, where we showed that you could use some graph, uh, graph matching techniques to figure out uh, which joint belongs to which person. Um, but yeah, that's, I didn't talk about it here, but that's, that's something that we've done. Yeah. So assuming you're able to scale up like, all three of these boxes and have you know, like, much better results what do you think are the biggest challenges taking that and applying it to actual robots? Because it's still a huge like, yeah. challenge of getting from that to like, real robotics. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's 
that's probably another uh, research area in itself, right? So there's, there's probably hun uh, thousands of people working on that problem. The, the, this is essentially the control and the planning problem. Um, it's, it's very hard uh, to kind of go from what we have to hardware because hardware is fickle. Uh, I mean, you, you can't control it with the same kind of granularity that you can control simulation. So there's you know, hardware challenges that need to be tackled. Uh, and also I think from an from a algorithm perspective, uh, I think you know many of the algorithms that we have today work great in simulation, uh, but they don't work work really well in in the real world. Uh, and we need to do more research into this uh, bridging this domain gap between synthetic and and real worlds. Uh, and I think that's something that's going to be critical to uh, being able to build robots that can you know uh, do these kinds of activities. Thank you very much. Yeah, for thanks a lot. Yeah, us, and we'll have some offline questions and some, don't forget to finish the. Cola and the pizza. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining and thanks for your talk. Thanks.